This is the beginning of four episodes that I think are really, really important because it's something that we all face, and that is how to break up with somebody. I want to talk to you about the Declaration of Independence today and how we are behaving today, where we are just mob mentality and go out in the streets and say awful things. I want you to look at the Declaration of Independence and what happened on June 7th, 1776. This is when the Continental Congress met in Philadelphia at Pennsylvania State House. That's known now as Independence Hall. And one of the delegates, he was from Virginia, his name was Richard Henry, uh, Richard Henry Lee. He introduced a, uh, a motion calling for the colony's independence. Now, everybody was like, oh, we got to break up with the king, man. He is treating us. I mean, we are not his biatch. Okay, and that's the way he's treating us, and I've had enough of this. Mm -hmm. So he suggests the Lee Resolution, and it was short and sweet. Resolved that these united colonies are and ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from the allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the great state of Great Britain uh, and ought to be totally dissolved. Okay, what's that mean? That's basically a breakup letter without any facts. This is like, I mean, this is what guys struggle with when you're taking somebody out and you're like, you've been going steady for a long time and now you have to sit there and you have to break up and you're like, no, it's not me or it's not you, it's me, but it really is you, it's not me, but what do you say? Wouldn't it be nice if you just text, be it resolved, we're no longer seeing each other. Well, there's one thing missing in this and that is why, why? So there was a huge debate in Congress, and they voted seven to five, and they said, wait a minute, let's wait. Let's wait for three weeks, and can somebody explain to the king why we're about to do that? So before the recess, they appointed a five-man committee to come up with a formal statement justifying the breakup with the king and Great Britain. They appointed two men from New England, Roger Sherman and John Adams, two from the middle colonies, Robert Livingston and Benjamin Franklin, and then one southerner, Thomas Jefferson. Well, the writing for the breakup letter, the Declaration of Independence, fell to Jefferson. Now, in the rotunda of the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., there are three original documents on permanent display, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. These are the three pillars of the United States, yet America doesn't even know them anymore. And that's why we have people in the streets. We really need to get reacquainted with who we are quickly. So Jefferson got this task because Jefferson, in a, in a letter to Adams, I think it was around 1820 or 1815, someplace in that area, he writes to Adams, uh, and he says, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Right? That is quintessential America. America, when we're at our best, is a nation that looks forward. The national attitude is what's to come, not be or was. But now, that's all we are. We are looking not towards the future with optimism, we are looking at the past with disgust and venom. And today, we wanna to settle scores. A recent national poll found 59% of Americans think we are currently at the lowest point in our nation's history that they can remember. I think that's true, but I think it's true after years of trying to figure this out because we don't remember who we are. America spends far too much time looking at the past, but only the bad past, only the things that we failed on, that we screwed up with, and we look for blame or excuses. Let's be honest. The, even the, the right is more concerned with owning the left at times than helping point anyone towards a practical principle in the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. America has clearly lost touch with who we are as a nation. I, expl I explain and explore this identity crisis in my new book, Addicted to Outrage, and it is really urgent that we get reacquainted with the Declaration of Independence, 
the Bill of Rights and the Constitution because postmodernism would have you believe that we've evolved beyond the America of our founding documents. We haven't. We've never truly lived up to all of those promises. They're not irrelevant. They're not irrelevant to the present, and they are certainly not irrelevant for the future. But the Declaration of Independence is a mission statement, a thesis statement. It is it's what we hope to build. Without it, America doesn't exist. Today, much of the nation is so addicted to outrage that the day-to-day -day outrage isn't enough to feed the addiction. So we have to reach in to our past to get our fix. In 2016, Democrats in the Louisiana State Legislature tabled a bill that would have required fourth through sixth graders to memorize and recite the opening lines of the Declaration of Independence. They didn't table it because they thought it would be too hard or too patriotic. They tabled it because the requirement would include the phrase, all men are created equal. And the progressives in the Louisiana legislature didn't want the children to have to recite a lie. Representative Hodges, I'm not really sure what your intent is, but one thing that I do know is all men are not created equal. When I think back in 1776, July the 4th, African Americans were slaves. And for you to, and for you bring a bill to request that our children will recite the declaration, I think it's a little bit unfair to us to ask those children to recite something that's not the truth. It is the truth. And um, I don't want you to take it to an old fat white guy. Read what uh, Frederick Douglass said. Because Frederick Douglass had that same view of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are not created equal, not in our founding documents. And Lincoln advised him, please, please read it, read it. He came back as the biggest supporter of the Declaration, Constitution, and Bill of Rights. Now, she says all men are not created equal. Another Louisiana Democrat explained that the government was born out of the Declaration, was used against races of people. Right. And that is true to some degree. It's missing a very important part that we should have learned in school, that the same government made slavery illegal and amended the Constitution to guarantee all men protection under the law. It was the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment that were an omission of guilt by the nation regarding slavery and an effort to right the wrongs. I really truly believe that the first 10 Bill of Rights, with a few exceptions, are just a restatement of, of the principles. Everything, the 11th, 12th, 20th, all of those amendments, those are just restatements of the first 10. What, you didn't get it, all men? Yeah, black people. What, you didn't get it, all men, as in women, too? Progressive logic goes something like this. Many of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, including Thomas Jefferson, who wrote it, owned slaves. Therefore, the Declaration of in is invalid, because if they own slaves, and we know slavery is evil, that must make this document invalid. But it is not. It is a very sad reality that the left has a very hard time appreciating the universal merits of the Declaration of Independence because they are so hung up on the issue of slavery and they are wrong. Please do not take my words for these things. Please do your own homework. To be clear, because people love to take things out of context, slavery was horrible. It is a total stain on our history. But defending the Declaration of Independence is not an effort to excuse any aspect of slavery. It is to show you the genius of a country. People will say, how could the founders approve the phrase, all men are created equal, when many of them owned slaves? How did they miss that? Well, they didn't miss that. 
In fact, it was Thomas Jefferson that included an anti-slavery passage in his first draft of the Declaration. In the first draft, in his own handwriting, the paragraph blasted King George for condoning slavery and preventing the American colonies from passing legislation to ban slavery. He wrote, and I quote, He, meaning the king, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights to life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. He is determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable commerce. We don't say execrable very much anymore, but it means detestable, ab 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 abhorrent, an abomination, very, very bad. So this is Jefferson talking to the king. He's, he's capturing these people, he's selling them on the open market, and he won't allow us to stop it. That's in the original Declaration of Independence. So why was it in the next draft? Jefferson was actually really angry when Georgia and North Carolina threw up the biggest resistance to that paragraph. It was those two states. Ultimately, those two states twisted Congress's arm to delete the paragraph because before they started this process, we all have to hang together or we shall hang separately. They knew they had to stay together or the king would stop the revolution. So the next argument would be, I guess, how could a guy calling the slave trade utterly detestable be a slave owner himself? There is no doubt about this. Human, uh, as a human being, Thomas Jefferson was very flawed. He had slaves from his estate in, in Virginia attending him while he was in Philadelphia, in the very apartment where he was writing the Declaration. The problem is, Virginia law made it more difficult for slave owners to free their slaves, especially if the owner had significant debts, as Jefferson did. Many of the Southern founders deeply believed in the principles of the Declaration, Yet, they couldn't bring themselves to upend the basis of their livelihood. Jefferson also went back and forth and said, we have the wolf by the ear, and we can't continue to hold him, but we also can't let him go. They were afraid that the slaves in the South would rise up and kill everyone for vengeance. The founders were not idiots. The founders wanted to end slavery, and they understood the ramifications of signing to the principles described so eloquently in the Declaration. They understood that logically, slavery would eventually have to be abolished in America because it was unjust, and the words they were committing to paper said so. Now remember, John Adams was part of this committee of five. And John Adams, he was going to work on the Declaration, and he later said the revolution would never be complete until the slaves were free. That is true, if we believe all men are created equal. Also, the same generation that signed the Declaration started the process of abolition by banning the importation of slaves in 1807. What they had to do is put the mission statement together, get everybody on board, win the war, then come back and say, okay, here's how we make this happen. And that, in the Constitution, is where you had the end of the slave trade. Jefferson was president at the time, and he urged Congress to pass the law. The Declaration did not enable and further slavery. In fact, it took a major step towards crippling the institution. It made the argument for the very first time in human history that the fundamental right of all humans, all humans existed, and that undermined slavery. Planting the seeds to end slavery is not nearly commendable enough for leftist critics, but you cannot discount the fact that the seeds were planted. It is as if you would say, you are not stopping abortion today. Or, if you're on the other side, you're not just making 
all abortion, including Peter Singer's idea of up to two years old, legal. No, progress, progressivism. You have to take the small steps and convince the people or it's war. What they did is they started an expiration clock for slavery by approving the Declaration. Everything that happened almost a century later to end slavery, and then a century after that with the Civil Rights Movement, flowed from the principles voiced in the Declaration. In fact, Martin Luther King quoted the Declaration a lot. Now, ironically, for a movement that calls itself progressive, it is obsessed with retrying and judging the past over and over again. Progressives consider this a better use of time than actually putting past abuses in the rear view and striving not to be defined by our ancestral screw-ups. It can be constructive to look at the past, but only if you're trying to learn from it to not make the same mistakes. Examining history can be useful in providing a roadmap for the future. And we have a very obvious one that as a nation, we're not consulting. But it's right there. It's under glass. It is faded because it sat in the sun for so many years. But this is what we are. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That means at birth, we're all equal. There's no king. There's nobody that has something that I don't have. No right that I have somebody else doesn't have. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's an aspirational goal. That's what founded America. The words don't die. The ink can fade. We can even forget them. But those words do not die as long as we continue to discuss them. Mike Lee and I have had a, uh, a nice relationship for several years. I respect him as a friend and also a, a senator and as a, a scholar. I didn't think there was anybody better to, to get on to talk about our founding documents than Mike Lee. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you, Glenn. So, Mike, let me, let me start with this. The Declaration of Independence is known mainly because of Wilson as a dusty old document that has no relevance at all anymore. Um, fact or fiction? Absolute fiction. It's the anti-truth. It's the uh, false doctrine of the first order. Look, the Declaration of Independence is sort of the uh, spiritual foundational doctrine uh, document of our country. Uh, it, it provided the, uh, uh, the feeling of the American people and still supplies that to this day. The Constitution is also important because it provides the structure and a series of uh, thou shalt nots. But mm -hmm. the, the, the spirit of our country, of what it means to be an American, is still in the Declaration of Independence. So and that's I, why we need to revere so it and I, study it. As I look at this, Mike, it, I see the Declaration as our, as our thesis statement. It's our, it's our mission statement. It is, this is what we're going to build once you release us from our relationship. We're, gonna, we're these people, we're going to build this. And the Constitution is, okay, here's the structure that will allow us to build this. If you change the mission statement, the Constitution itself, without the Bill of Rights, could really be used to build any country, could it not? Yes, that's exactly right. And that's why the Declaration is so important. That's why we ought to still study it. That's why we ought to still care about what it says. It also reminds us of why it is that we became our own country in the first place. Why it is that we no longer fly the Union Jack or sing Hail to the Queen. Uh, this had to do with a whole lot of things uh, beyond deciding we didn't want to be part of a monarchy, beyond uh, the fact that we didn't want to become, uh, to continue to be part of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, this was about liberty, about the dignity of the human soul. And that's why we ought to continue to read the Declaration of Independence every time we get a chance. I will tell you, um, Mike, I, I'm a fan of the Declaration of Independence. I've never had a good answer on the slavery thing for the Declaration of Independence until I acquired an 1830 engraving of the first draft. And I was going over this draft, and there is one section where Thomas Jefferson's handwriting even changes, and he begins to capitalize things. 
And that drew my eye, and it's in the, it's the last us usurpation, if you will, from the king, and it makes the case against slavery. Uh, the abolishment of it says we've tried to, he's stopping us, he's enslaving people, it is violating everything we believe in. It was taken out because of two states. How is this not being taught in school? How come we don't know that? Because it changes everything, does it not? Yeah, I think it certainly does. I, I, I think it gives meaning, first of all, to the early lines within the Declaration of Independence that recognize we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and that governments are instituted among men uh, to, to promote and protect these ends. It makes a whole lot more sense when we understand what Jefferson wanted to do, uh, what he was precluded from doing, as you say. But it, it also gives uh, additional meaning to the words that survived. It helps us understand what he contemplated and what we should still contemplate when we envision the kind of society we want to have. Mike, would you say the slavery argument then is almost like the abortion argument now? If we really believe that abortion is murder, why, would we, why wouldn't we grab our guns and kill everybody now? Well, because we believe a civil society is important for all of us, and we need to change people's hearts and minds. You can't force them into it. Isn't that the same argument that the founders used on slavery? Either way, you're arguing that this is a person. You've got a person that may not be protected under a particular state's laws. And yes, you're exactly right. We have to start with the society we have rather than the society that might have been, had better decisions been made earlier on. Yeah. So we start with that decision. It's one of the reasons why we have to look through history and figure out how it is that we got there and figure out the fact that uh, a, a lot of the abolition movement um, really gained traction in post-revolution Massachusetts, yes. uh, where there was this brave young slave named Mum Beck who, who read the Massachusetts state constitution that acknowledged that all human beings were free and equal. She sought uh, to win her freedom in court and won. So step by step, uh, this started a process that would culminate nearly a century later in the liberation of all slaves in this country. Mike, thank you very much. Why is our country so lost? Why are people so angry with each other? Why can't we get anything done? I contend it's because we have lost the sight of who we really are. So who are we? Well, you have to go back to, I think, the greatest breakup letter of all time, the Declaration of Independence. It is a genius document that is so well worth your time to really read and reread. It gives us the answer, coupled with the Constitution and Bill of Rights. It's all you need. Let me take you back to when they first drafted this. Thomas Jefferson, 33 years old. He's at Congress, 1776, Philadelphia. It's the summer. It's really hot. Thomas Jefferson's a radical, which caused John Adams to like him immediately because John Adams was a cantankerous radical. Then the Congress stuck Jefferson and Adams together, and they created a five-man committee to write a formal statement justifying the, the breakup with Great Britain. Because if you've been along, you know, if you've been, if you're in a marriage, you can't just say, I want a divorce. You have to say, why? This is when Adams and Jefferson really started to love each other. Uh, uh, Jefferson thought Adams should write the declaration, but Adams said, no, 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 I can't come from me. I'm obnoxious, and I'm really disliked, which was true. And Adams reasoned that Jefferson wasn't obnoxious or disliked, therefore he should write it. Plus, he told Jefferson, I mean, you are really one of the greatest writers of all time. Again, true. It was a master class in passing the buck. So over the next 17 days, Jefferson holed up in his room, applying his skills to the crafting of the ideas of the Enlightenment, or the defining of them. He borrowed freely from existing documents like the Virginia Declaration of Rights, uh, and he wrote, quote, he was not really trying, striving for originality of principle or sentiment. Instead, he hoped his words served as an expression of the American mind. He achieved his goal 
Unfortunately, we're out of our right mind right now. Now, when he wrote it, the five-man committee came in. They changed about 25% of the first draft of the declaration before they turned it into Congress. Then Congress alter, altered that about one-fifth of that. But the Declaration's words are Jefferson's, including the most famous passage, the preamble, which Congress left intact word for word. The result is the greatest mission statement of all time. The result is the greatest breakup letter of all time. The words are what held us together at our darkest times, and they are what we desperately need to rediscover now because of our raging addiction to outrage. The Declaration of Independence is something you learn at school and you're taught that it's an old dusty document, but it's not. It's brilliant and it, it, it is good for now and a hundred years from now. It has multi-purpose. It was, it was to rally the troops, to gain foreign allies, to announce a new nation, but it really was to set principles in stone and say, when we get away from you, King, this is what we're going to do. So it is, it's broken up in five different sections. And I want to explain this really as a breakup letter, as I do in the book. The introduction, the preamble, the body, composed of two parts, and then the conclusion. Ultimately, it crafts a genius breakup letter. In addiction to outrage, I take an in-depth look at the Declaration and translate word for word its breakup letter format, line by line, into modern language to explain it. That chapter in the book is a great primer to help you get reacquainted with our original founding documents. But I want to give you a taste of what I, what I mean when I say it's the greatest uh, breakup letter. The introduction. The introduction is notification I think we need to break up, and to be fair, I feel I owe you an explanation. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, right? The Continental Congress felt they were entitled by the laws of nature and nature's God to dissolve the political bands, but they needed to prove the legitimacy of their cause. They they actually really liked the king. They didn't really want to break up with him, but he just kept being a jerk. So the defying words, most powerful nation, that powerful nation going to get these words and that wasn't going to be good. The king wasn't going to like it. And it had to motivate foreign allies to join the effort. So what are you going to do? What, how, are you going to, how are you going to do this? How are you going to say something that's going to piss off the most powerful nation on earth and inspire everyone else. So they set their, their struggle within the entire course of human events. So the entire human play. This is not some petty political spat. This is a major event in world history, a game changer, a pivot point for humanity. So we have to break up with you as step one. Step two is why? I, I, you don't understand me. Here's what I'm looking for in a healthy relationship. Y you don't know who I am. I have to tell you why I'm breaking up. It's because I believe in the course of, or in, that, um, that uh, all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And we hold these truths to be self-evident. That's a big deal. This is who I am. And among those rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you, as my boyfriend or my husband or whatever, you don't get it. That part is pretty much everything the people in America know about the Declaration, if they even know that. That's the preamble, and it's in our DNA. And it really needs to be taken, however, as a whole that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That means the only reason the government exists is to secure those rights, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, meaning the people are empowering this government to protect the rights. 
and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to those ends, meaning protecting the rights, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Now, this gets dicey because there's not a period there. It's a comma. And to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So you can't just say, burn it all down. You can't say, we're going we're gonna to throw these bums out and we're going to start from scratch. No, you have, to, you have to have a plan that will protect those rights better than this government. Have you heard anyone suggest one? The preamble takes us through a logical progression. All men are created equal. God gives all humans certain inherent, in, inherent rights that can't be denied. That those rights include, meaning there's more, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To protect the rights, we've set up a government. And when a government fails to protect inherent rights, people have the right to change or replace it. Government is there to protect the rights. They don't have any power unless we give it to them. That's a radical concept, even today. Because you say that idea today, that radical concept today, people say, no, we get it from the government. No, no. The preamble is the justification for the breakup and revolution. But notice they don't mention anything about Britain yet. They're framing this as a aspirational idea, a big universal idea. These are fundamental pr um, privileges and, and principles. They're, they're not just, hey, you know, and you won't pick up your socks and your underpants. These are principles that make the declaration as relevant today as it was. It's not just a dusty parchment that applied in 1776. Then we get to step three. Here's why it didn't work out. It's not me. It actually is you. This is part one of the body of the Declaration of Independence, where Jefferson starts to flex his lawyer muscles. He lists 27 grievances against the British crown. This is their specific proof of their right to rebellion. He says he's obstructed the administration of justice. He's imposed taxes on us without our consent. He's suspended our own legislatures. He's quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. Again, Congress presented these causes which impel them to separation in universal terms to appeal to an international audience. It's like they were saying, hey, join our fight because our fight is mankind's fight against all tyranny. And it was. Step four, demonstrating the actions you took. Look, I tried to make this relationship work. I talked to you. I talked to your friends. I talked to your family. Here's how. This is, here's part two of the body of the text. It explains how the colonists had tried to plead their case directly to the British people, only to have the door slammed in their face. They said, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. They, too have been deaf to the voice of justice, meaning the British people. We must therefore hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We need to break up. Here's, here's why, here's who we really are, what we believe, these big ideas. Here are the things you're doing that go against all of those things. We asked you over and over again, you just made it worse. And then the last part, they wrap up America's argument for independence. We haven't been treated justly. We tried to talk to you about it. You refused to listen. So we're done. Now they state the intent. So I think it's best we go our separate ways. And my decision is final. This is the powerful conclusion. If people know any part of the declaration besides the preamble, it is this that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. They didn't leave any room for doubt. The relationship was over and America was going to reboot on its own with all the rights of an independent nation. 
And then they said this beautiful line, and in support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This was a breakup letter. If your boyfriend was a serial killer, they knew they would die by breaking up. The message was clear. This is not a pitchfork mob. We're not going to try to get vengeance. We just want to go our separate way, and we know you're dangerous. These were serious men who had carefully thought out the issues before taking action. This was not a political movement. Most of these men, it killed them to break away from the king. But they put everything on the line for this cause. The Declaration of Independence is a landmark in the history of democracy because it is the first formal statement of a people announcing their right to choose their own government. That seems obvious, but it's only an American idea. And in 1776, it was unprecedented. Nobody had ever said that. In 1825, Jefferson wrote that the purpose of the Declaration was not to find new principles or new arguments never before thought of, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plainly and so firm to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take. You're not going to ever do better than the Declaration of Independence. It worked as a means of breaking away from Great Britain, but its genius is the principles of equality, inherent rights, self-government. As long as we remember who we, who we wanted to be, we've never perfected it, we've never gotten there. But it seems to me we've stopped trying. I, for one, don't want to give up on it. We've made so much progress as a nation, as people, as humans. I still hold those truths to be self-evident. Let's not throw it away. Let's study it and take the next great step into a very bright future. Mike Lee, um, Senator from Utah and um, a scholar on the American founding and our American documents. I believe he should be our next Supreme Court Justice myself. Um, Mike, uh, thanks for joining me. I want to I take you to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. A recent study shows 37% of Americans cannot name any of our First Amendment rights. 33% of Americans could not name any branch of our government. There is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Declaration of Independence is, and people don't think it's relatable. Can you, can you tell me, if we understood our founding documents, how the Kavanaugh hearing might have been different? Mm. We understood our founding documents. I think we would have a lot more respect for the immortality and the eternal dignity of the human soul. That's really the essence of what the Declaration of Independence was, and a, a recognition for the fact that governments exist for the benefit of human beings rather than the other way around. Uh, the Constitution, in turn, gave structure uh, to these basic principles. And I think by putting that structure in place, the Founding Fathers deliberately took steps to make sure that we wouldn't get caught in another one of these dangerous uh, whirlwinds that we were in prior to the revolution, where we were subject to a large, distant national government that taxed us too much, that regulated us too aggressively, and was slow to respond to our needs. So I think if, if we had more Americans reading our founding documents, aware of them, understanding why they were written the way that they were, there would probably be a whole lot less contention, not only surrounding this particular nomination, but surrounding the court itself and even the federal government itself. It right. was designed to be a smaller, narrower government. And it shouldn't be as contentious as it is. People are saying, you know, I don't want a conservative judge on the court. Well, 
quite frankly, neither do I. I don't want a liberal. I don't want a Democrat. I don't want a Republican. I don't want a conservative. I want a constitutionalist. So explain why, uh, the, uh, explain what that means. A constitutionalist is really the role of a dice for people. You, you know, you, they don't always, it doesn't always come out in your favor as a Republican or a, or a liberal. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I don't want someone with the Republican elephant label uh, on their robe, either literally or metaphorically. But what I want is someone who will first understand the necessarily limited role of the federal judiciary, the fact that it's there to decide cases and controversies and decide questions of federal law, whether statutory, constitutional or otherwise. Uh, and, and you want somebody who will read the law on the basis of what it says rather than on the basis of what they might wish it meant. And somebody who's also willing to recognize that the, the federal government was always designed to have powers that Madison described as few and defined, while those reserved to the states are numerous and indefinite. And that we've got three co-equal branches of government. Each one needs to stay within its lane. That's what you want. Those won't always lead to a Republican outcome. But right. they will always lead to an outcome that respects the dignity of the human soul. So the, the change in the Supreme Court really came with FDR. I mean, I, I was amazed to find out that when the Capitol was built, they forgot about the third branch of the government. And if I'm not mistaken, the Supreme Court held court in the basement of the Capitol for up until, up until FDR. Up until April 12, 1935. Uh, they held court in the Capitol building itself, first in the basement, in the old, old Senate chamber. Uh, then when the newer old Senate chamber came into existence, um, uh, they, they were able to move. Uh, when, when In 1859, when the current Senate chamber was completed, uh, the, the Supreme Court moved upstairs to the other old Senate chamber. It wasn't until 1935 that they moved across the street. But it was right during this time, during the FDR administration, in fact, two years to the date, after they moved into the new Supreme Court building on April 12, 1937, they decided a case that would fundamentally change the nature of the federal government. They, in effect, adopted one of the most significant constitutional amendments ever, but did so without amending the Constitution. Which was what? NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel Company. This was a case involving the interpretation of the Commerce Clause. Uh, a part of Article 1, Section 8, that gives Congress the power to regulate trade between the states with foreign nations right. and with the Indian tribes. And it had previously been understood to give Congress the power to regulate channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce, you know, interstate uh, roadways, waterways, mm -hmm. and so forth, and interstate commercial transactions. You know, uh, let's say you live in Texas and I live in Utah and, mm -hmm. and buy and sell something across state lines. Congress can set the terms of that. Beyond that, it was supposed to be the states that would regulate economic activity, especially purely local activities like labor, manufacturing, agriculture, and mining. Those were all state domain. But after April 12th, 1937, this all changed because the Supreme Court said the Commerce Clause now gave Congress the power to regulate basically any economic activity. This was based, was this the farmer, was this the farmer with the wheat? This was five years before the farmer with the wheat. This okay. was uh, uh, five years before a case called Wickard v. Filburn, yes. uh, where they used the same doctrine developed in 1937 and said that this farmer, uh, Roscoe Filburn, had committed this grave offense against the United States government. He grew too much wheat. He grew more <laughs> wheat than these, these regulators in Washington, D.C. deemed appropriate, and so he had to pay this hefty fine. And they said it was no defense that the wheat he grew in excess of the national limit uh, was wheat that never entered interstate commerce, never entered commerce at all, because he used it on his own farm to feed his family. The Supreme Court said it doesn't matter, because this wheat substantially affects interstate commerce, and therefore Congress can regulate it. That changed things fundamentally. That, if we could repeal, uh, if we could repeal that, how much of American freedom would be restored? Uh, what this would do, Glenn, is that it would allow for the ideological diversity of our country uh, to play out, mm -hmm. meaning it would let New York be New York, let mm -hmm. Utah be Utah, uh, let Nebraska be Nebraska. There are big differences among and between the states and their populations. Mm -hmm. You'd have more people getting more of the kind of government they want, fewer people getting less of the kind of uh, yes. the government they it, don't want. 
it is it is letting San Francisco be San Francisco and El Paso be El Paso because they're very different places and that's the way it should be. So why are we in so much trouble in a, as a nation? We are in trouble because we no longer remember even who we are or how this machine is supposed to run. I want to take you back to July 9th, 1776. This is when a copy of the Declaration of Independence reached New York City, where the British naval ships were occupying New York Harbor. And the revolutionary spirit and tension were running really high. It was in the summer. Everybody was excited about this. George Washington was now the commander of the Continental Forces in New York, and he read the declaration aloud in front of City Hall. This is now right, the building right across the street um, and down just a little bit from um, the New York Stock Exchange. And the crowd just cheered wildly. Later that day, they tore down a statue of King George III, which is kind of like what they did with Saddam Hussein's statue. What's great about this is when they pulled that statue down, they melted it down and made 42,000 musket balls for the ragtag American army. And America's separation from Great Britain was officially in writing, and so now came the hard part. The Declaration of Independence defines who we are, what we believe, and what we aspire to be. It is our thesis or our mission statement. And no one said that it would be easy to implement, and no one said it would always be fulfilled, because nobody had ever said this before. It was not just an official announcement of our split from Great Britain. If it was just that, it would have been a lot shorter. It was an announcement of a new company, a new country, a, a new idea. And they said, this is what we believe. This is what we think we can build. This is how we're going to build this country. This is what we're going to base it on, these ideas. It didn't just declare independence. It declared principles. It declared how we were going to organize ourselves once we were out on our own, and it sets up the guardrails to help ensure that we didn't end up you know, being like the country that we just left in the first place. So the founders did their best to set us up through the Declaration for success. But America, from time to time, uh, fumbles, and it falls, and it slips away. But it is this time happening because we have a very dangerous addiction to outrage. And in our national discourse, it's, fine to, it's hard to find uh, you know, agreement on the fundamentals like the Declaration of Independence anymore. That was never difficult. We need to find time to relearn the old-fashioned things like the Declaration. But it's hard when social media can fuel our outrage around the clock. How often do we jump to outrage before we have any kind of perspective on the matter? For that matter, how often do we retweet something that we haven't even read? President Trump was only in office for about a month before a hundred activists rewrote a version of the Declaration of Independence, rewording it with Trump in the King George III role. Trump had been in office for a month. That shows a lack of understanding of what the Declaration really was. The focus has shifted from unity to partisan winning at all costs. And in this process, we have lost touch with our national DNA. Our basic knowledge of the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights is so weak that we don't have a clue how they even work or relate to one another. As of late 2017, almost 40% of Americans could not name any of our First Amendment rights. Speech, religion, petition, assembly, hello. 33% of Americans couldn't name any branch of our government. None. Now here's another example of our painful misunderstanding. This is an article that came from Psychology Today. It was written before the 2016 presidential election. And this was written by a doctor who was trying to figure out a way how people could understand Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And this is what he came up with. He said, and I quote, Trump re represents the Declaration of Independence and Clinton represents the U.S. Constitution. What? 
He tries to explain that Trump supporters are eager to declare their independence from the political swamp system. And for the Constitution side of things, he says it, the Constitution, may have stood the test of time for so long because it was drafted following a long, costly and awful war the Founding Fathers wanted to prevent that from happening again. That intention possibly enabled them to create a document that was relatively free from special interest and personal agendas. Hillary Clinton is more like the Constitution than the Declaration of Independence and appears to be more about getting things done than declaratively taking a stand. No, uh -uh. I don't think that's it, Doc. Beside this being a completely bogus way to interpret Hillary Clinton, this comparison makes your brain hurt because it so fundamentally misunderstands the relationship between the Declaration and the Constitution, because they are not rival documents. He says, the Constitution has stood the test of time because the founders wrote it to prevent another long, costly war. No, no, it stands the test of time because it was designed to protect the unalienable rights of the Declaration. He goes on to say that we need a new constitutional convention because we just may need to retrofit it to fit modern times. Again, no. This is what primarily the left is uh, now trying to sell us today, that the founding documents worked well for their time, but they need an overhaul. This was tried in the 1940s and in the teens of last century, but it was wrong then and it's wrong now. Progressives seem to live by the motto, if it ain't broke, fix it. Rather than fixing things, however, when we understand the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights as they are, we discover they still work because they are tied to universal principles that happen in all times, not a specific point in time. So I want you to look at the Declaration and the Constitution in a different way. The Declaration is our mission statement. It's who we are, what we believe, what we aspire to be. The Constitution is more like our, our blueprint. Here we say, okay, we're gonna build a house, and this house is gonna be great, it's gonna have a big family in it, it's gonna be a fun place, and, and it's gonna have lots of light in it. Okay, you have to go to an architect and draw up the blueprint so you know and you kind of codify everything the family has said is what we want in a house. That's the Constitution. And then the Bill of Rights is kind of like insurance. It's our insurance policy. It, it reminds, just in case anyone ever says, ah, oh, you know what, that Declaration of Independence, where did I put it? I lost it someplace. I got it someplace. I don't know where it is. We took these rights that we hold self-evident. We took these, it says, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, meaning there's more. And so we took and we said, you know what? Let's expand and show what some of those, some of those rights are. And that's the Bill of Rights. It was an insurance policy in case this ever gets lost or this ever goes wrong, these must never, ever go away. Now, aside from the practical business of separating from Great Britain, the gist of the Declaration is that humans have natural rights, and they're granted to us by God. The reason why they were granted by God is we needed something bigger than a king or a government. And those rights cannot be compromised or taken away by man. The Constitution, then, is the, okay, how do we design a government that best protects our natural rights? That's what the Declaration of Independence says governments are instituted among men to do. So the creation of the Constitution did not give us rights. The existence of our rights, recognized by each other, allowed us to create the Constitution and create a government which its first duty was to codify and protect those rights. Government doesn't have the authority to deprive us or print new rights. The progressive and postmodern idea that rich white guys founded the uh, American dream as an exclusive country club for enriching themselves just doesn't hold any water. If that had tr seriously been their true intent, they seriously handicapped themselves with the emphasis on rights 
and the checks on power that they included in these three documents. Any honest reading of the Constitution and the massive ratification uh, debates that dragged on in individual state legislatures make one thing very clear. The founders were extremely paranoid about corruption and abuse of power. It's almost like they knew men would always go bad. So they designed a system to avoid as much of that as possible by keeping things as small as possible and making sure they codified those rights and built a government to solely, primarily, I should say, protect those rights of the people. But still, this Declaration, Constitution, Bill of Rights trifecta thing, it's just a conservative line, right? We just say that because we're all stuck in the past and we're in denial about the new, improved, diverse, post-gender, post-modern America, right? No. As the Declaration itself says, let facts be submitted to a candid world. In 1839, on the 50th anniversary of George Washington's inauguration as the first president, the New York Historical Society invited former president John Quincy Adams to deliver a speech. Now, he's the son of John Adams. John Adams was there and helped write the Constitution. Well, John Quincy wrote a speech about something near and dear to his heart, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And here's what he said. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States are parts of one consistent whole, founded upon one and the same theory of government. It had been working itself into the mind of man for many ages, but had never before been adopted by a great nation in practice. He goes on, even in our own country, there are still philosophers who deny the principles asserted in the Declaration as self-evident truths, who deny the natural equality and inalienable rights of man, who deny that the people are the only legitimate source of power, who deny that all just powers of government are derived from the consent of the governed. I speak to the matters of fact. There is a Declaration of Independence. There is a Constitution of the United States. And let them speak for themselves. Well, they can, and they do. They don't require any interpretation or updates because our inalienable rights have not changed. Progressives believe that our rights come from the government. But the Declaration emphasizes that our rights are inalienable and granted to mankind by something bigger than mankind, God. By the way, we usually only use the word inalienable when we're talking about the Declaration of Independence. So most people are like, what is that? Is there aliens coming out of my butt? Some, what is that? It means that it's not transferable. It's not something that is capable of being taken away denied or changed in any way. It is solid and no man can do anything about it. We don't know our founding documents anymore and because of that we are witnessing the disastrous results of this deficiency. We have lost sight of what made the American Revolution unique. It's the only one that ended in real freedom ever. It was the first time Subjects who had colonized new lands rebelled against the country that they came from. A government by the people and for the people is a principle that changed the world. Most countries fall apart after their revolutions, but we thrived because of the thir firm principles of the Declaration and the protection of those principles in the Constitution and Bill of Rights. We're not perfect. We've never gotten it right, but we've gotten better. And that's the point. It's a really unique system with a great track record in spite of humans screwing it up. But this system is not inevitable. For it to continue to work, we have to understand it, protect it, by living it. David Barton from wallbuilders.com uh, joins us now. David, uh, your book that you've just released called This Precarious Moment, um, I think states it very well, but I'd like you to make the case that this is a moment that we haven't really seen and this can go away pretty quickly if we don't turn back 
to how did Washington say it that the smiles of heaven could never be expected uh, for a country that that forgets the uh, how is it you you must know this uh, he says the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of right and order that's right life real and order. simple so we have that's forgotten right. those and is that what's bringing us to this precarious moment I think part of it is we're so used to being a stable nation We've had a constitution for 231 years at a point in time when world history, average constitution is 17 years. We've just been here so long and we just expect to always be here. We don't know revolution. We don't know war. It's not in our thinking. Uh, and, and we just kind of assume anything we do, we're, we're still going to be here. We are at a point in time where we are now openly embracing philosophies that have led every single previous nation to a precipice. Uh, that if they went over, you don't come back from. And, right. and we have really three or four things going right now that are non-recoverable if we cross that line. Can you give me those two real quick? And then we're going to get into the Declaration. Great example. Um, there is no nation in the history of the world, 5,500 years recorded history, that has become socialistic, that has remained a world power, that has preserved individual freedom or maintained national prosperity. Never happened. Nobody's ever done it. Uh, we're at the point now where that 75% of students in college believe that we should go to socialism. Right. Uh, so, we're at the point so, where 53. Hang I'm on. Sorry, Glenn, go ahead. I want to. I want to make clear this because this is this is the point they keep bringing back. Well, look at Sweden. Sweden is a capitalist country, just like Canada is a capitalist country. It is not a socialist country. And are you going to tell me that Sweden is a world power? I mean, are, are you going to look at Scandinavian nations that have a 68% tax rate mm -hmm. and tell me that that leads to prosperity, individual mm -hmm. prosperity? Sure, mm -hmm. you can pick and choose things in, in those Scandinavian nations that you say, well, that's really good. But look at all the cost that goes with it. Mm -hmm. They are not the full power. They are not the leaders in technology and prosperity. They are not the leaders in innovation and freedom. Um, that's just the, the reality of who they are. We are. Or we used to be. Some of the Swedish countries now lead us in economic freedom, which is absolutely amazing to me. Um, David, right. David, we um, are now hearing things, you know, and it's been going around for a while, but now nobody has um, a clue as to who Thomas Jefferson is. Um, they think all of our founders were racist and wanted slavery. Let me go over a couple of things. First of all, I, I wrote to you this weekend as I was doing some research. Boy, we are a couple of geeks. And I wrote to you and I said, David, doesn't the Northwest Ordinance prove that our founders compromised on the Constitution because they had to, but their intent was to have a country with zero slavery, no slave trade, no auction blocks? Answer? Yeah, there is no question that was their design at the national level. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, of all people, was one of the leaders in the crusade to get rid of the slave trade in America. Uh, he worked in his state to free slaves. His state would never do that, would never go along with him. His state would not allow him to free his own slaves. But Jefferson introduced the first national anti-slavery law. It was defeated by one vote, amazingly. Um, Jefferson in the Declaration was very outspoken about we have to end this. And so Jefferson is actually the guy that back in 1784 proposed in what became the Northwest Ordinance that we abolish slavery. We, we end it. Uh, that didn't happen. 1785, they brought the law back, the Northwest Ordinance. They said no slavery in, in federal or national territories. And then they brought it back under George Washington. He signed it into law. They said any federal territory, you cannot have slavery in any new territory that's to become a state. Now, the way around that, and by the way, Jefferson pointed out that it was only North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina that vehemently embraced slavery. And so if you look at a state like North Carolina, well, that's where the state of Tennessee came from. So that's not under the Northwest Ordinance. Hmm. Uh, the same with Virginia and Kentucky. That's not under the Northwest Ordinance. But... As you look at Illinois and Indiana and, and Ohio, and you look at Minnesota and, and all those states, they came in under the law signed by George Washington that required that you not have slavery. That went until long after his death. In 1820, Congress changed that and said, that's not fair. We have too many anti-slavery states now. Hmm. We need to encourage slavery. 
Oh. So it was Congresses long after the founding fathers that reversed that law. Uh, the, the Missouri Compromise started saying every free state that comes in, you got to have a slave state to match it. It's got to be one for one, even Stephen. So here came 1820, the slave state of Missouri. Here came the anti-slave state of Maine. But that was not the founders' intent. And I was recently talking to a guy who said, oh, the founders are racist. Said, Here's the deal. You name a founding father that's pro-slavery. I'll name five founding fathers that were anti-slavery. Let's see who runs out first. <laughs> and so the guys on the other side can name three or four or five, but there's 250 founding fathers. Three-fourths of these guys were anti-slavery, spoke openly for abolition, or ran anti-slavery, or joined anti-slavery societies. So that was not their design, and, and those who misportray the Northwest Ordinance and the Declaration, they just get it wrong. Tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson and uh, the things that he tried to say about the Declaration of Independence, where he said, you can't read the first part at all. You just have to read the grievances. That's the only important part. If you read that, the only part that people know is the preamble, the beginning of it. We hold these truths to be self-evident. You can't um, cleanly oppress people if you get rid of that preamble. I mean, here's a guy who, you know, propped up the KKK and uh, resegregated, you know, the, the nation. Isn't, isn't that the first sign of somebody who is trouble if they say, oh, uh, forget about the preamble? Well, if they say forget about the Declaration in any part, there, there are problems. Uh, if you look at every radical movement we've had in America that wanted to reshape the culture, including the pro-slavery movement, the first thing they do is dismiss the Declaration. Uh, the Declaration, not just its preamble, the first 161 words set forth the six principles of American government that the Constitution absolutely enshrined. And, and so that's why uh, the Founding Fathers said, hey, we did not disannul the Declaration. The Constitution did not replace the Declaration. To this day, when President Trump signed a federal law last week, that federal law is dated not to the Constitution, it is dated to the Declaration. The yeah. Constitution dates itself to the Declaration. You can't dismiss any part of the Declaration. So let's, tomorrow, we'll pick this up, we'll go to Woodrow Wilson, but I also want to hear the six principles that are laid out in the Declaration. There are six, and they are important. We'll do that on the next episode. In this series, we have been trying to figure out a couple of things. How did we get here? And what is the solution? And it's all about the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, they were close friends and they were bitter enemies. And then they were close friends again at the end. And I find it fascinating that both of them willed themselves to live uh, for the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And both of them died on that day, July 4th, 1826. Adams was 90, Jefferson was 83. They had, you know, obviously failing health and they declined to go out and, you know, celebrate with others on July 4th. Adams sent a letter to be, around, uh, to be read aloud on the 50th Independence Day celebration at his local town in Quincy, Massachusetts. And he wrote that the declaration is, quote, a memorable epic in the annals, annals of human race, destined in future history to form the brightest or blackest page according to the use or the abuse of those political institutions by which they shall in time to come be shaped by the human mind. It is remarkable to me how well the founders understood human nature and what could happen to the United States. We will either go out a great nation or we will become the darkest plague ever to be on earth. It is the postmodern mindset that increasingly rules the U.S. now that has infected our institutions and untethered us from the bedrock principles of the Declaration. In its place, vindictiveness or outrage or, or uh, you know, oppression of some sort. And it's more addicting than we understand. Less than a century after Adams and Jefferson died, the most serious attempt to undermine the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution came from America's 28th president, 
Woodrow Wilson. This is one of the many reasons I despise this guy. Wilson actually wrote, some citizens of this country have never gotten beyond the Declaration of Independence. Celebrate! That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. What are the principles in the Declaration of Independence? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? During Wilson's career as a college professor, he thought deeply and wrote extensively on his contempt for our founding documents. His issue with them formed the core beliefs of progressivism that are still alive today. In 1911, before he was elected president, Wilson said in a speech, I do not find the problems of 1911 solved in the Declaration of Independence. It is the object of government to make those adjustments of life which will put every man in a position to claim his normal rights as a living human being. So do you see what he's done here? He has completely turned the Declaration of Independence upside down and inside out. He's saying that you don't have inherent rights until the government puts you in a position to claim them. That's the heart of progressivism. This is the problem. The government is supposed to protect the rights that we get from a higher power. We have those rights. We institute government. He's saying government is on top. Now, in a later speech, he said, quote, if you want to understand the real Declaration of Independence, don't repeat the preface. The preface? You mean the part that says we hold these truths to be self-evident? Some of the, one of the greatest lines ever written? That's right. He didn't like them. Because Wilson didn't think the equality and natural rights and consent of the governed, those parts in the Declaration, give or define the proper role for government. He preferred the Declaration's list of grievances because they addressed specific problems at the time. And that's what he thought a government was uh, in place to do, solve problems for people. And since people's problems change over time, so should the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence is just something that you look at and go, oh, look, they had problems too. Wilson said, no doubt we are meant to have liberty, but each generation must form its own conception, uh, conception of what liberty is. That's one of the only things I kind of agree with. Another key to Wilson's progressive theory of government was human evolution. He thought that because humans were now more enlightened, they could be trusted not to abuse government power. That's not true. That is not true. The reason why I kind of agree with that, that last segment that he said is because it is up to us. It's up to every generation to say, yes, I recognize liberty and that's what I want to fight for and that's what I want to preserve. And each generation has to do that. We don't progress as, as man past our darker selves. Every man is born. Dark side, light side, which side's going to win? The Declaration's committee of five would have laughed Wilson out of the room. It is hard to believe that in less than 150 years after the signing of the Declaration, the U.S. President, Woodrow Wilson, would be saying things like this. We are not bound to adhere to the doctrines held by the signers of the Declaration of Independence. We are as free as they were to make and unmake governments. We are not here to worship men or a document. And every 4th of July should be a time for examining our standards, our purposes, for determining afresh principles, what principles, what forms of power we think most likely to affect our safety and happiness. And that alone is the obligation on the Declaration that lays upon us. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. We do, each of us, have to, and it would be great if we all sat around on 4th of July and decided, are we going in the right direction? But you'll notice in the Declaration it says it's their right, it's their responsibility to unchain themselves from any government that becomes, you know, tyrants. However, that's not all it says. And it must form a new government that more effectively will protect those rights. Those rights do not even belong to the individuals, let alone the government. They belong to the higher power. It is our job as individuals to protect them, and that's why we institute government. 
Wilson was so effective on imposing his philosophy on government that he for, forever diverted the U.S. presidency away from the Constitution. Progressives have kept Wilson's church alive ever since. I mean, it makes sense. A guy who says, you know, there is no equality, natural rights, and the consent of the governed in the, um, in the Declaration of Independence, it makes sense that that was the guy who br breathed new life into the KKK and resegregated our government. He didn't think everybody was created equal to him. That was not self-evident. Progressives are still hostile to the Declaration of Independence because of the idea of historical contingency, which holds that truths change over time. Progressives think self-evident truths of the Declaration are outdated and no longer apply. And that means the Constitution, based on those truths, may no longer apply as well. Wilson and progressives especially do not like the whole separation of powers thing because the founders, and you'll hear this in the news all the time, it's too slow, it's too slow, we can't get anything done. Yes, that's what they wanted. They wanted the House to be able to react quickly. Then the first check on that was the Senate, then the President, then the Supreme Court. They wanted it to hinder fast action because they didn't want the government to be making all of the decisions. People were, towns were, states were, not the federal government. But now people want a justice warrior president who will bring swift change by fiat. That's not our system. The current trend in attacking the Declaration and the Constitution is to tear down the men who wrote them. In late 2015, students at the University of Missouri and the College of William Mary placed notes all over the statues of Thomas Jefferson on their campuses. The handwritten notes labeled Jefferson, like things like uh, rapist, racist, pedophile, which I'm not even sure what that's referring to, how dare you glorify him? I wouldn't be here if it, wasn't up, if it was up to him and Black Lives Matter. Well, this handiwork of the students who are so blinded by their outrage addiction that they can't see the value and the merit that the Declaration still holds for all people today. A lot of people, um, a lot of people um, uh, think a lot of different things about um, Thomas Jefferson. And you dare not defend Jefferson. And if I say anything, well, I have to be discounted because I'm also a white guy. But there is a reasoned defense of Jefferson written by Annette Gordon-Reed. She is a respected history professor at Harvard Law. She also happens to be a woman and black. In, resp in response to the protest over the Jefferson statues, she wrote, quote, I understand why some people think his statues should be removed, but not, at all con not all controversial figures of the past are created equal. I think Jefferson's contribution to the history of the United States outweighs the problems people have with aspects of his life. He is just too much a part of the American story to pretend that he was not there. The best of his ideals continue to influence and move people. The statues should be stimulus for considering all these matters at William and Mary and the University of Missouri. At the opposite end of the spectrum from Woodrow Wilson uh, and his disdain for the Declaration is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln loved it. He didn't find it outdated. He thought it was absolutely perfect for his time. If there is an overarching theme in Lincoln's speeches, it is the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln, as did Martin Luther King, pointed the nation back to the Declaration as our mission statement. He challenged us to end slavery and preserve the Union based on this. Unlike Wilson, who recommended leaving out the preamble, Lincoln considered it the most vital part. To Lincoln, the self-evident truth was universal and timeless and more important than the list of grievances, this part. He felt that these truths uh, were applicable to all men in all times, that today in, in all the coming days it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. There was a speech that Lincoln gave, it was like 1861, 
shortly after he was elected president of the United States, and he said this, I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. He went on, I've often inquired of myself what a great principle or what great ideas it was that kept this thing together for so long. It wasn't the mere matter of the separation of the colonies from the motherland, but that sentiment in the Declaration which gave us liberty, not alone to the people of this country, but hope to the world for all future time. Lincoln went on to say that he would rather be assassinated than see the nation forfeit the principles of the Declaration. In fact, his Gettysburg Address was a renewal that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. We can't assume that the radical idea of freedom will always be embraced by Americans. It has found hostility on our shores every step of the way. The principles are not liked by those who want to control people. Those principles have to be continually defended, but they have to be learned and understood. While humans do have certain inalienable rights that are endowed by our Creator, there is also darkness in the world. And for some strange reason, humans, while valuing freedom, also seem to have this natural bend towards tyranny. When we get afraid, we have to have somebody take us out. And that's why we talk about these things. It's not alarmist to say that this is under attack. It's not a quaint history lesson. It's reality. Right now, the fundamental principles of the Declaration of Independence are under attack. And if we don't know them, if we can't defend them, if we can't articulate them from here, left to its own devices, its own mob devices, America would turn its back on freedom. Shortly before his death in 1826, John Adams was asked to recommend a toast that would be given in his honor on July 4th. Adams didn't hesitate, he said, Independence forever. A small group of visitors glanced at each other for a moment before somebody said, is there you know, anything else you want to say? He shifted forward in his chair and leaned on his cane, and he stared intently at the men, and he said, not a word. David Barton from wallbuilders.com and the author of a new book called This Precarious Moment, uh, joins us to talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, David, let me start with Woodrow Wilson. He said, some citizens in this country have never gotten beyond the Declaration of Independence. I don't find the problems of 1911 solved in the Declaration of Independence. It is the object of government to make those adjustments of life which will put every man in a position to claim his normal rights as a living human being. Tell me how this dismissal of the Declaration of Independence uh, will uh, fail to give us the six founding principles of government. Well, you have to understand that Wilson has a viewpoint. He is an open racist president, one of the most racist we ever had. It was under him that we have the, the second revival, the Ku Klux Klan. His writings were used by the Klan to promote the Klan. So it's understandable he does not like the Declaration of Independence. If you have a viewpoint as radical as he does, including on the size of government, the scope of government, you definitely don't like limited government, and that's what you get in the Declaration. The six principles the Founding Fathers set forth in the hundred, first 161 words are real simple. And this is the order they set them forth in. Number one is there are absolute moral rights and wrongs from which we derive truth. So the laws of nature, nature's God, we hold these truths to be self-evident. You have the, the truth that everybody is entitled to the right to life and liberty and property. Those are truths. Those are not open for discussion. Okay, so the that's second principle. Second, okay, that's the first one, all right. Second one is there is a creator God. There is a creator who gave us these truths. We look to him for that source. So we openly acknowledge a creator God. David, why is that, wait, wait, why is that important? Because there be atheists oh. or people who don't believe in God, and they'll say, well, so then what? I, I, can't, I can't relate to this now. What happens is if you do not acknowledge that there is a creator God and that that applies to government, then government will eventually believe that it is God. 
and right. they will tell you what rights you do and don't have. So what we did in the declaration, and I find it significant, Glenn, that when they said that, they said that this is the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. All 13 of us agree that there's a creator God. We want everybody to know that because that's how we have limited government. Mm -hmm. that, that keeps you, for example, in Germany right now, if you try to homeschool your kids, you will go to jail because kids belong to the state. If you share your faith in France, you will go to jail. They call it proselytization. It is a crime. You don't have the right of free speech. If, if there is not a God who gives you certain rights, then government will decide what rights you can and can't have. Okay. So the second principle we had is there is a God and government. You are not God. The third principle they gave us was that from God, we get a certain set of inalienable rights. They come from him, not from government. The founders identified about two dozen rights that came from God, not government. Their position is, since they came from God, government, you cannot regulate these. Whether that's the right of self-defense, the right of conscience, the right of speech, the right to justice, uh, the right to keep and bear arms, however you want to say it, and these government, are, you can't touch these. And there are more. The The 10th Amendment says that <laughs> there are more, and they belong to the people. Yeah, the Ninth Amendment is very clear. The, the Founding Ninth. Fathers enumerated, between the Declaration and the Constitution, you have about 16 enumerated rights, but they said among others. Uh, for example, Jefferson and Franklin talked about the, the inalienable right of expatriation. Well, that's not listed in any document, but they said it's an inalienable right. So there's about two dozen that government is not allowed to touch or put its hands on. Okay. The fourth. The fourth principle they laid out. Fourth principle, they said that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So the purpose of government is to secure inalienable rights first and foremost. That goes above securing the borders, that goes above maintaining the economy and military. The first thing government does is make sure that nobody interferes with your right to have inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. The fifth thing that they said was that below that, we govern by the consent of the governed. That's the, the majority rule principle except you can never vote on moral issues and you can never vote on inalienable rights because those are established by the Creator. And the sixth principle they said was that if government fails to secure these rights, these first five principles, the people have a right to abolish or to revise their government. So you have a right to a government that recognizes these five principles. If your government doesn't, then you have a right to create a government that does. Yeah, it's so very... Those are the it, six principles it's very interesting to me that, that that last one is you have a right to alter or abolish, comma, and replace that government, which has become hostile to these rights, with one that is more suited for taking care of these rights. So you don't have a right just to abolish the government and say, yeah, we're not going to do these rights anymore. We're going to do a communist government. Can't do that according to the Constitution. You only have a right to abolish it if you're going to rebuild a government that is stronger at protecting the individual human right. That's pretty yeah, profound. That's exactly, that is profound, and that is exactly right. Remember, these guys were schooled in John Locke's two treatises of government. They were schooled with Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. Those were books that laid out the purpose of government. And government's not to do anything we tell it to do, it is given a purpose from the Creator. And if your government doesn't do what the Creator said government, and, and this is the point they understood. If you have a government that does what the Creator says, that will give you maximum happiness, maximum freedom, and maximum prosperity. And that's the purpose of government. And if your government doesn't do that, then it's not acting by what the Creator told it to do. Right. And you have a right to go get a government that will do that because, again, that's freedom, happiness, and prosperity. Right, and that's, that's different than having a state religion. It's not talking about religion here. It's talking about these human rights. They understood that the Creator is giving individuals rights. Religion may not do that, and states may not do that. And that's why um, it's different than anything else. When people say, we don't want to confuse religion, you're right, we don't want to confuse religion. But the Creator and His rights are vital to this country. Well, look at the debates. In, in the 1840s, the debate was over whether you have a God-given right to liberty. Well, black people don't. Hey, by the way, we don't like the Declaration of Independence because it says you have a God-given right to liberty. 
Th that's yeah. where Woodrow Wilson was. Yeah. In the 1970s, it's, hey, there's a God-given right to life. No, 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 there's a Roe versus Wade. We right. don't do the declaration. We get, right. So anytime you want to fundamentally move away from a right and give government the right to decide those rights, we say the declaration needs to go away. And yeah. that's always a, a bad sign when they say that. David Barton, thank you very much. Make sure you pick up his book, This Precarious Moment. It is uh, six steps that will help us heal our families and our country.